DCI Music Video, the leader in music instruction and the first company to release instructional music video, brings you the best. about playing a little phrase and then leaving space and I can hear the hear what the how the drums would fill that in at everybody every time you say something so sometimes you uh, if you did you frighten them I think the same thing musically DCI Music Video, the first in instructional music video. We set the standard.
That was Outback. The rhythm in this is very similar to Space Boogie, the track I did with Jeff Beck, but we locked off one of the beats, so it's in 6-4. The main thing about playing a track like this, or like Space Boogie, is pacing. It's a really high energy track. Double bass drums throughout the whole song. Well, nearly throughout the whole song. And it's very easy to just blow the whole, all your cookies in, in the first song. And especially if this is put in the early part of the set, you've got to be fit to play the rest of the set after playing this song. So that's one of the things to really look out for when you're playing a, a high energy track. The other thing, with a double bass drum track like this, it's not necessary to just go like, you know, slamming full out. It's actually better to be a little reserved because you'll find musically it will overpower everything. So it's best to just reserve it and keep it really, you know, keep the tension there. Um, and leave room for the odd accents, leave the dynamic room as well. You notice when we get to the solo section, I really just pull back and let like, Anthony just just ride in there to give Ray some space to solo. Uh, it's dynamics, but it's also pacing with a track like this. There are a lot of little little ghost notes in there, which uh, is you know again like Space Boogie is is very important. Um, in this next clip, you'll see the whole rhythm slowed right down, so it's very easy to see what's going on. Okay, now we have it a little bit faster, just to build up a little bit of speed, and you can see how it's coming together. really fast, up to speed. The other rhythm in this song is the chorus section, which I use a, a little bit of a face-to-face -face, uh, rhythm, uh, those who are familiar with that, the Pete Townsend song. Um, it just, you know, helps break up the double bass drum thing, it's a different section, uh, it has a little bit more impact. Very simple, really, uh, you'll see in this next section, the slow down version. speed.
I started playing double bass drum in 1974. The main thing I noticed was the way that the kit instantly became more balanced. With a single kit, I always found that I was a little lop lopsided. The bass drum was here, snare drum, and it was, it was okay. I didn't really know anything different. But as soon as I put up that second bass drum, the whole kit, the perspective was, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And apart from two years, I think 1975 or 76, I have always played double bass drum. So it's been, it's been a long time now, these guys, we've been together. My concept for tuning the drums is I like to keep them the same. I find they're more balanced that way. I think they sit better when you're playing double bass drum. When you're playing little fills, not necessarily a consistent pattern, although I think that's better when they're tuned the same. But it's when you do a little fill, which I, I often do, you just put in the two kick drums. To me, when they're sounding as close as you can get them, they feel more comfortable. Mind you, I might look at this video in uh, a few years and look down at my 18-inch bass drum and my 26-inch bass drum and say rubbish. But for now, that's, and that's the concept, and I've stuck to that for quite a few years. As you can see, I start off tuning the bass drum by having it laying down on the floor, and then I start off by just tensioning all these up finger tight. You might notice that I use uh, key rod tension rods as opposed to T-bars. Uh, various reasons for this. Uh, it's often you get the bass drum tuned how you want it, then you have to pack it away in a case, and invariably you've got to move a couple of the T-bars. And also does avoid people's trouser legs getting caught in them and all sorts of other things that tend to get uh, caught up. I just prefer these. It's a lot neater. It's a lot easier to tune. And then once I'm satisfied that the head is laying on the shell, okay, I then just start tuning. Keep pressing the center making sure that it's sitting nicely. And basically just tune until I get all the wrinkles out. And a few little wrinkles up there. Okay, and then once I've got it tuned fairly evenly, I then put quite a bit of weight on it to really stretch it out. It's a big head. There's a lot of glue that needs to be unstuck. Once I've done that, I then tune it a little bit more. Make sure there are no wrinkles. Another one up there again. There we go. And then, to really settle the head in, I find the best way of doing this is such a big drum, it's going to take ages for it to play in. So I tend to use this little technique. Just lay a bit clean. Make sure there are no razor blades sticking out of the sneakers. And then, give it a good stretch. I haven't been through one yet. And then, once you've done that, you can then turn it up the right way. I just so happen to have a pedal handy, which, by the way, I use very, very loosely. The spring is very loose. Pop the pedal on. And then, Come around the front here. Uh, 
as with the rest of the kit this is this is the only drum I actually really damp to any degree but I keep it to a minimum I just get a towel preferably a hotel towel I don't know why they just they sound so much better Sheraton actually very good and then I just roll it up a special sort of croissant shape a little bit of gaffer on the towel then lay it in and then you use gaffer tape to keep it attached to the head and then in go the spurs and on goes the front head again I don't use a hole in the front head I put the mic inside tension the head up and try to leave it as live as possible a lot of people ask how do I practice double bass drum how did I get into that whole concept of playing double bass drum I actually treated them as another pair of hands except they're just a different shape and they usually have uh, you know shoes covering them um, but apart from that I, I give them the same attitude as my hands but I allow for the limits of the feet so I slow everything down so I play a series of exercises which I would play on the snare drum single stroke double stroke I try a little bit of triple stroke I play some paradiddles on the bass drums um, and the other thing I do is play rhythms play a little solo on bass drums and that really helps to loosen up the feet it's very important to to really find out your limit I find with bass drum playing if you're relaxed you can get to a certain speed and then if you really tense up and you're sort of on the nerve you can get it quite quickly but there's really no control and if you try to slow it down a little from that quick speed it's it you lose it so it's very uh, it's very interesting actually how pure control over the feet how slow it can actually be so there's nothing wrong with practicing very very slowly again I think it's accuracy it's giving the notes each a full value Velocity is very important, and also being seated and relaxed. So the first exercise, really, is just single strokes, very slowly. When I practice, I tend to keep my heels down. I don't really know why. This never happens when I play, um, you know, when I'm playing for real, except when I play quietly, my heels can drop. But for practicing, for some reason, I prefer to keep my heels on the foot plate. So, just basically, one hit on each drum. And then try it really, really quietly. Single strokes, a little bit faster. The next exercise would be double strokes, two on each bass drum. And again, just very relaxed and very slow. A little bit faster.
and then occasionally I do attempt three strokes on each, like this. And of course, there's the old paradiddles. Again, single paradiddles would be the first one. And a double paradiddle. And a triple paradiddle. And then we can put all three of those together. So you play two singles, two doubles, and two triples. And then you can just play anything, anything that comes into your head. One of the little tricky things that uh, I think is actually a very good exercise for coordination is back to our dear friend the paradiddle. And I've devised this little exercise which uses paradiddles on the bass drums and paradiddles on the snare drums. Except one is half speed. So for example, the paradiddle on the snare drum will be half the speed to the paradiddles played on the bass drums. And this is a real mind bender, you know? Really gets the coordination going. So we'll start off with the bass drums and I'll add the paradiddle and the snare drum. And then of course, the other way around. gets the brain going. Another one which I discovered fairly recently is this little exercise which basically uses three beats with one hand being answered in triplet form with two beats by each bass drum. So I'll just play it really really slowly. We've got That's a real awkward one. It's a good one to practice because if you can get around that one, then whichever side of the kit you're on, you can start things with one hand and then to the other. It's endless.
That song was called Cosmos. The idea behind this track is really a, a sort of rap, house-type groove with some you know, sort of interesting music on top. And the main requirement in this is groove playing, just sitting down and holding down a rhythm. Uh, a little hard when Anthony plays the way he does and Ray does what he does, but that's really the essential part of playing a song like this. Um, and it's really, uh, most of the playing is pretty straightforward, pretty simple, uh, apart from the uh, silly fill at the end. Um, I just wanted to see, the, 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 the effect I wanted to bring out was just something totally manic wild um, and that's really what the fill's all about and then it suddenly goes back into this very controlled little rhythm at the end um, and that's really the whole thing with cosmos timekeeping playing with a click these are questions that often get asked when I do clinics I'm amazed at how many drummers in studios have their clicks so loud. It's unbelievable. Um, apart from being damaging to your ears, it affects the music. I find, I just, if I hear the click too much, I get distracted. So my concept really is, if I can't hear the click, I'm in time. And as soon as I start to hear it, I must be getting out of time. To show that, I'm going to just play a little bit of the songs that we played, and you're actually going to listen to my headphone mix. I think it's essential to practice with a click, but I think it's also just as important to practice without one. It's important to create your own center of time. It's important to find out where your weak points are. When I'm doing a, a song, recording a song on a session, sometimes, I, I would say most of the time I'm playing to previously recorded tracks and so I'm sent the track with a click. But when you play in a live situation, uh, occasionally we actually play without a click. It's all live. What I found very helpful is after we've done a couple of takes is to put a click on, play the take with a click. It's amazing how you it, it points out immediately to you the sections where you're slowing down or speeding up. It's a very natural human thing to do when you play the verse. You know, you're sort of quite relaxed. Then you get to the bridge 
and then you all tense up to get to the chorus, and the speed does go up and down a little bit. I don't think there's anything wrong with that if it suits the music. If it doesn't, then it should be in time. And one of the ways to do that is to play the song a few times, just without the click, put the click in, you'll instantly know where you're speeding up, slowing down, then play it without the click. It's a, it's a good thing to do. I'm going to demonstrate a little bit of what I've been talking about in this next piece, V8. This really shows playing with a click, playing with preset music, but also taking it right out, going right across the rhythm, across the bar lines, and coming back in the right place. Here it is, V8.
This next song, which we're going to play, Force Majeure, is really all about a drum machine groove adapted for a song. Um, the actual rhythm part in the verse utilizes the octobarns, the gong drum, and some sneaky little hi-hat things, as well as a, a backbeat in there. Uh, the backbeat really only comes once in the bar as opposed to twice. And here, this is a slowed down version, just to show you really what's going on here. This is how it should sound, up to speed. The idea with this song was to have a set rhythm, like that one, set around a very melodic setting. Um, it's that mixture of uh, something, I guess, that is, it's, it's fairly technical in its approach, but it has to be played like it, it's very, very comfortable. The nice thing about uh, l listening to uh, drum machines is that they're capable of playing something very complicated but the same every single time and it's a great challenge for uh, a drummer to play like that a repetitive figure which is very even in terms of all the beats that are played each note is given its full note value but it also has that human element. The little grace notes, the little nuances you can do, the little change maybe, the odd hit and the odd tom-tom or the odd cymbal. Uh, to me that's the, the whole thing about this, this song and this rhythm from a, from a playing point of view. Um, obviously there's a lot of, it's a long song, there's a lot of interaction with Ray and Anthony uh, and again as well as concentrating on your own pattern, you also have to have the obligatory big ears to listen to what they're doing and to be able to take what you're playing and let it recede a little bit into the background and listen to what they're playing without losing what you're playing. It goes through a lot of changes. There's a long solo section, which every time we play this, will be different. Again, the, the obligatory large ears. Um, and that's, that's the fun of doing, uh, I suppose, playing music like this. Um, as we get towards the end, there's a whole end section which uses some more patterns, fixed patterns. Again, using the drum machine attitude, but making it very, very fluid. And I'm now going to show you all these end rhythms played slowly, one through to the other.
now those same patterns up to speed. Okay, now I'm going to close this tape with the performance of Force Majeure, and you'll be able to see all the little octoban, gong drum, and all the other things in it. 